Um, I'll explain briefly how we're going to run the evening, but everyone will do the introductions to their topic as we go along, otherwise it's rather a lot to remember. So, uh, first of all, I may introduce Richard Witter, who's the brand manager of Quintana de Naval, and Richard will talk a little about the, the um, about Naval, and you've all seen the beautiful pictures, you don't have maybe here, but you all, all have seen the beautiful pictures on the invitation, so rather lovely place, and he'll explain all about it and about the port production. And then we will taste the first two tawnies. Ah, oh, Mary's made it. Excellent. Um, we'll taste the, the, the first two ports, tawnies, um, and alongside them we have two cheeses. We've suggested one particular cheese for each one. Uh, and then we have very carefully chosen chocolates. In fact, we're going to start with the chocolate, aren't we? We're going to do the chocolate first, and then the cheese, and yes. And we suggest that you um, sort of cleanse your palate a bit with a biscuit in between. Um, Marie-Pierre, whom I'm sure you all know, but yes. leads a double life as <laughs> well, yes. a board, a board member of the Academy of Chocolate and the uh, Awards Ambassador. Yes. Um, and has been working with Amade and with William, in fact, and, and um, um, MP will, as we know, talk a little bit. About we'll talk a little but bit. I, hope, about the I mean, there are, there are other people from the Academy of Chocolate around here, and you. Come on, you're the great expert to talk about the chocolate as well. I think it would be nice if we had contributions from the floor. Oh, we certainly want reactions, don't we? <laughs> yes, we want reactions. We want reactions. It's good to be, I'll say a little bit about the cheese, you, but um, um, yeah, it's, it's, very, about the cheese. <laughs> it's, it's very unusual better. cheeses. They're all raw milk cheeses, yes. and they've been chosen for a very particular purpose, each of them. So, But let's start with Richard yes. and, and, and his tale of the Quinta de Naval. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, my name's Richard. Um, I, I will... I'll sit down. Sit down. So yes. So I will. Um, I'll start by just talking about port in general, and then a bit about Quinta de Val. I never know what everyone's knowledge of, of port is as a wine. Um, so let's start there. So port is a fortified wine, um, and it's produced in the um, region just outside Porto, so along the Douro River. So the name port comes from the city of Porto. Um, Legally, all port had to be shipped from the port of Porto, um, and that's where the name comes from. But the vines and the vineyards in the pictures you'll have seen are in the steep hillsides that surround the Douro River, about 80 miles inland from Porto. So if you follow the river up, you'll get to the vineyards. Um, a fortified wine just means that alcohol has been added to a base wine which is produced in a very similar method to any other red wine, but you add alcohol to it, and that's called fortification. And the purpose of adding alcohol, um, it's a historical purpose, the same with the other great fortified wines of the world, Sherry and Madeira. Um, these wines were sent to export markets on boats from major shipping hu hubs. So in the case of Sherry, from the port of Cadiz. In the case of Madeira, that was the Portuguese stop-off point to explore the new world. Um, and Porto, from Porto itself. When you were shipping wine in cask, everything back then wasn't shipped in bottle, it was shipped in barrels and bottled at its destination. Um, and back in the 1600s, 1700s, when you're shipping wine in a barrel, and the hygiene isn't quite what it is now, um, if the alcohol is lower than about 15%, um, all these bacteria in there start to act and you get funky results. So the best way to stabilise a wine for these long journeys, especially when you're crossing the equator where it's very warm, was to add alcohol. And you take the ABV up to around about 18 to 20% alcohol, and that stabilizes the wine. Any bacteria is killed, nothing's going to happen to it, and it will arrive at its destination as it's in, well, as um, it arrived in the destination in the same condition as when it left. Um, so that's how port became a fortified wine. Um, and then in more recent times, it's um, you have <coughs> different expressions. We're going to taste the two main production methods of port today are tawny ports and vintage ports or ruby ports. So the two main categories are tawny and ruby. I'll explain a bit about that when we get to those styles. Uh, but that's port as a wine. Um, and Quinta de Naval, what makes it different? Um, I was actually chatting to someone this morning and he was like, what's new in port? So Quinta de Naval was founded as a vineyard in 1715, so 300 years ago. So these are very historic wine growing regions, so not much new happens. <coughs> Um, however, Quinta de Naval is different in that the name, Quinta de Naval, Quinta means farm or vineyard in this case. So the name of the brand refers to the place 
where it's from. The other great porthouses are the name of the producer or whatever, Kinton of Al, it's the it's the vineyard. So Kinton of Al is one single estate. It's about 350 acres and it's all their owned vineyards of Kinton of Al. It's a single estate and that estate has had three owners over its history. And the De Silva family, who passed it to the Van Zella family, and then the start of what we would, um, well, we always say we just talk about since 1993 onwards. But, um, <laughs> but in 1993, it was bought by a group called AXA Mulesi, which is a French um, insurance group, AXA, and they have an arm of fine wine um, properties. So they own some properties in Bordeaux, Quinte de um, a Sauterne, the south of France, there is a property there, and um, Disnoco from Tokai, and a few others. Um, but at this point, this is when Quinte de Val started to do things differently from the other main port houses. The vineyard is, is exceptional, it's a, it's a fantastic site, it's probably one of the best sites in the, in the Douro Valley. Um, and Christian Seeley, who took over in 1993, decided to completely renovate the winery so, and the vineyard. So he replanted 70% of all of the vines on the estate over a period from 1994 to 1999. And so that's a huge undertaking, grubbing up vines where he didn't think they should be, planting the correct grape varieties in the correct part of the vineyard. So you have a huge range of altitudes from 300 feet down by the, the river up to 1,600 feet at the top. And obviously the temperature in summer down in the valley floor gets very, very hot and higher up you get cooler evenings, generally cooler temperatures. So different grape varieties prefer to be at different temperatures depending on whether they ripen early or late. And so this was a huge project, replanting everything, rebuilding the terraces. On your pictures you'll have seen the, the terraces cut into the, the steep slopes. So that allows you to, I'll pass around some pictures, I've got some pictures on here actually, oh, so I'll pass them around in a moment. Um, that allowed easier access to the vines for harvesting. Everything has to be harvested by hand really because it's so steep. <coughs> and, um, and generally just making sure that the correct grape varieties were planted in the correct places. So it was modernising a very old and ancient vineyard. Um, and this also extended to the winery itself. So port is pressed by feet in Lagar, which are these wide, shallow troughs. You'll have seen pictures. I'll, I'll, I'll send this round because um, the Lagar, you need to see a picture of. So let's get you some pictures of these. And I'll get to you. So here we are. Where's the picture of the people in the Lagar? <laughs> <laughs> so people are going to be sitting there, really. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be right at the end. There we go. It. There we go. So, um, <laughs> so, oh, so it's foot trodden <laughs> in these shallow <laughs> but wide um, troughs. And back in the um, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, all the history, the, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. right. There we go. There we go. Right, don't touch anything <laughs> on the right-hand side. So the, um, <laughs> the floor of the Lagar. What am I doing? That's right. Um, <laughs> there it is. Up this side and then it won't. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the, uh, the floors of the Lagar were porous stone. And when you have a porous stone, any of you with porous stone at home, it starts to absorb things. So bacteria, the hygiene in these ligars, because you're people barefoot treading the grapes, the hygiene wasn't that great. Um, so all of these were changed as well to granite, which is not porous, so much easier to clean, much cleaner. All the ligars became temperature controlled. You don't want temperatures getting too high when you're fermenting grapes, otherwise bacterial, um, anything like that starts to spread quicker. So temperature controlling the ligars, changing the, the uh, material they're made from to be more hygienic. And all of this has implemented, has created better quality port in the grapes are better quality. The wine is cleaner, everything is, has been modernized. So that should hopefully mean that Kinton of the wines express the quality of the vineyards that we have. Um, and that was the aim. Are they still on trial by foot? Yes, yeah, for, for all of the, the vintage ports and the Colletta and the 10 year old tawny, most of the 10 year old tawny, the grapes are, are tried by for. Uh, yeah, it's um, the reason for that. When I talked about fortification, so the addition of, of alcohol, we use a, it's a neutral grape spirit, a brandy, uh, French brandy for historical trading reasons. 
Um, and it has to be over 87% alcohol, I think that number is correct. Anyway, it's up around there. So high, very high alcohol. The idea is that all it does is increases the alcohol content of the port and imparts no flavour whatsoever. This fortification is done midway through the fermentation of the grapes. So fermentation changes sugar into alcohol. So we add the alcohol once the wine has naturally fermented to about 8% alcohol. And that leaves behind lots of sugar. So the sweetness in, in the glass that you're drinking now, the sweetness in all port, is sugar from the grapes. And it's kept in there because the alcohol added kills the fermentation, kills the yeast, stops the fermentation and the sugar's left over. Um, because of that, you only have about 24 to 48 hours to press the grapes before you have to add the alcohol. So it's a race against time to extract as much colour from the grapes as possible, as much flavour, get everything out as quick as possible before you have to add the alcohol. And that's why you do it by foot. It's the best way. And why these troughs are shallow and, and long and big? Because it's a greater surface area of grape pulp to the juice. So you get more <coughs> colour in the juice. Um, so Fiona's going to pour the two wines. I need to actually, a bit of housekeeping, the first wine was actually um, the Colletta that you got a glass of, so you got a special treat by having the Colletta 2005 as a welcome glass. So we're going to pour the um, Tenuel Tawny in the clean glass, and then the Colletta in the glass that you've already had if you, if you need a splash more. Yeah. This is the tenure of Tony. <coughs> so while this goes around, any, any questions? I'm aware I've kind of just been bombarding you with information for a while. Any, any questions about kind of the production method, anything like that? Anything I've spoken about so far? Sorry, can you I'm obsessed with feet? Yes. Can you? Um, oh, what? Yeah. No, that's the, that's the best question. This should be going in the clean glass. The benefits. Yes. Very good question. No, the, the, the best question glass. is I'll always the simplest them. question. So why feet? Yeah. Um, and the reason is, so in a in a grape, whether it be red or white, the pulp is gives a clear juice. In a red grape, all of the colour, so for all these red wines, any red wine you have, all the colour and the flavour and the tannin comes from the skin of the grape. If you ever get a grape and peel it and eat the pulp and then the skin, the skin is bitter and has lots of tannin and the pulp is, is clear. But then inside the grape you have pips and pips are really bitter. If you've ever eaten a, a seeded grape and cracked a pip, you can tell it's, it's quite bitter, quite astringent. So when you're making wine, you want to get flavour from the skin but you don't want to break any pips. And the pads of your feet are perfect because you've got a nice little bit of skin, which any pip will just embed into the skin and won't crack, but you can get all the force you want to grind the skins up, but the pips won't crack. So some producers, and this is, it's, um, it's just a different way of doing things, but you can have robotic feet, which are essentially <laughs> metal plates with a bit of silicon, uh, wrapping around them so that the pips don't crack on metal and the <laughs> silicon and the plates do the work. Um, so the, at Kinsley Labar we have a few robotic legar so you can't always get the people to be foot treading. Um, the vintage ports are always foot trod but uh, depending on availability of uh, treaders, not everyone wants to march up and down a, a legar for hours upon hours, you might bring in a robotic legar which are these pads with silicon covers on. So, so that's why it's, um, it's the most efficient way of, of getting the colour from the skins without cracking the pips. Do they do it to music? Yeah, they do. They do. Well, so you have, um, initially it's all very regimented and you do a certain number of steps up and down and this is so, um, an hour in, in one march and then an hour in another march but then the last, I don't know, I can't remember how long it is, but basically at the end they get out an accordion, play some music, and it's freestyle, and they just dance in the, in the legar. But initially, it's very regimented, um, and then the last hour or so is a, is a, is a bit of a freestyle. So then they, then they get the music out. Yeah. Is there a sort of foot inspection before they <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the alcohol kills most things. <laughs> I do remember having very soft feet the end of it, <laughs> and it was only the first stroke. Sorry, you've been having my feet in the regards this year twice. Ah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. 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 And it stains your, it stains your legs for quite a while. Really make sure you rub every 
Yeah. Shred of juice back into the lagoon. Oh, yeah. If you get out, you've probably got at least a bottle's worth of port on your neck. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, um, And if you've got it ever again. In a special way, you know, we're talking like it as a joke, which is that there has there's been no other way that they have found that it's as efficient. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and do you find your skin is lovely afterwards? Well, yes, your skin is lovely. <coughs> <laughs> Very soft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so these two ports you've got are tawny ports, so I'll just explain about tawny ports, how that's made, and then we can move on to the... Ah, we can... So there's the, the two two oh, different sorry, the, one the one you already have is the Colietta, um, although you can have a splash more. Yeah. Film is coming around now, so you can have a splash more. So the yes. So the two arms of port production, Tawny and Ruby, um, it's the same starting product. Sorry, there's a bit of Oh yes, no, don't worry. That's Tawny. It's Tawny. So these are two Tawny. So these are two Tawny styles. Yeah, I already drank that. Yes, I know. The one you just drank was the Colietta. Yes. But Fiona can top you up so that you can have them side by side. Oh, Yes. If people have people have got a bit left in their glass, they'll have two. Or <laughs> if everyone was enjo enjoying the colliers, so they'll be. Yeah. Yes. Make sure everyone. Let's make sure everyone's got a, a bit of both. So the tawny styles, I would always serve um, chilled, kind of this sort of temperature. The if you were to pick a serving temperature, I would say 13 <coughs> to 15 degrees. Um, it's very hard to get wine at that exact temperature range. So with tawny port, I just have it in the fridge and then it will come up to temperature. So if you take it out 20 minutes before you're going to drink it, it'll be a really nice, pleasant temperature. But the reason is with any fortified wine which has high alcohol, so any, where the alcohol is anything above about 18%, when the temperature gets up to a living room in the UK, which is about 25 degrees or above, the alcohol starts to come off because alcohol is a volatile um, co compound, it will come off. So when you come to taste the wine, you'll just get hit with alcohol first in your nose, and alcohol is an anaesthetic, so it will numb your, your nose and your palate, so you won't get to taste the full complement of, um, of aromas in the, in the wine. So always have them slightly chilled. The ruby stars, which we'll taste later, um, about 16 to 18 degrees, so it would be, the ruby stars of port would be talked about as served at room temperature, but the room temperature back when all of these mm -hmm. traditions were set was a lot cooler than the room temperature now. So eight, 18 degrees, something like that for, for a vintage. But I always always err on the side of, if it starts off a bit too cold, then it'll it'll warm up. But once, once the wine has got too hot and it's like drinking soup, um, it's very hard to get it cool again other than dropping an ice cube in the glass, which you don't want to do. So, um, so yeah, I, I always err on the side of cooler. Um, but yeah, no, good question. And uh, yeah, that's the, the main reason is because of the alcohol content and you just don't want to get that waft of, of alcohol, it, like a spirity nose when you're tasting it. Um, so yeah, so these two are, oh yes, sorry. Good. Um, I'll just explain Tawny Port and then we'll do, okay. then we'll do Tawny. So Tawny Port, um, exactly the same starting process, so <laughs> picture grapes, you trod them manically for 48 hours, alcohol's been added, and then it's drawn off and put into cask. So tawny port is put into smaller wooden casks, so these are around about 600 to 1000 litres, um, which is smaller in the scale of things in port, and that gives you a larger surface area of the cask to the volume of wine, and they stay in those casks for, in the case of our 10-year-old tawny, an average of 10 years. Um, and then the air is getting to it, so the colour is, is lighter, the oxygen is acting on the wine, so you get flavours of nuts, caramel, these oxidised characters in the wine. And when we go into the ruby styles, they're in much bigger barrels, so there's a much larger volume of wine to surface area, so there's no um, apparent effect of oxygen on the wine. So in the case of the 10-year-old tawny, it's a blend, a blend of different barrels of different ages. And the idea is that the average age will be 10 years, and you will add some complexity from old barrels, some youthful fruitiness from young barrels, and that will give you your 10-year-old tawny average. 
with a Collietta. It's a Tory port, but from one year. So this is bottled from all barrels from 2005. So this is just the expression of the 2005 vintage, aged at the Tawny port. So this was bottled this year, in 2019. So 2019, take 2005, someone does some maths, 14 years. So it spent 14 years in barrel. Um, and all those 14 years, the air's been getting to it. You get those lovely nutty characters, some caramel from the oxygen and, and the interaction with the wood. Um, and because it's from a single year, and they generally tend to pick the best years. In the Collietta, you'll find a slightly higher acidity, a little bit fresher, and the sweetness analytically is a little bit higher just because of the age. When you age in wood, you lose water through evaporation, so everything else concentrates. Um, sweetness is now um, just over 100, so about 110 grams per <coughs> litre in the Collietta. The 10 year old is about 95, 97 grams mm -hmm. per litre. Um, but hopefully it doesn't seem sweeter because the acidity is also higher and that all balances. Um, so yeah, so that's the difference between these two and that is the difference between Tawny Port and the next two. Smaller barrels and a longer time in barrel. Right, let's right. have some cheese and chocolate. Some cheese and <laughs> well, let's, let's start with the chocolate. Too. So yeah. do you want both out at the same time? Now? Well, chocolates or just the first one? Well, I place. think we could try the two. Do the two? Fine. Yes. So which, which one? So, we're having, so we think to have the the, um, the chocolate pair, pairings were suggested by William, mm -hmm. who has worked with Novant Port uh, over the years. In fact, I, d I don't know if some of you ever came to the Academy of Chocolate Conference about 200 years ago, no exaggerating, about eight <laughs> years ago, the, um, or 10 years ago, uh, William had uh, devised some chocolates using, made using the ports to drink with the ports and he, he was the winner because we put it out to people at the conference to taste the ports and the chocolate made with port or, or the, the pairings together. And he was the great winner. And he went to Naval, did he, he did, not? He and he, he um, he's kept working with yeah. Naval. Can we just, while you're talking, can we just say so, these facts? Yes, as, absolutely. <laughs> so his so suggestion for the, uh, the 10 year old Tony is, that one. is a chocolate muscovado caramel. I think yeah. he, so this, this is one? the orange, this is the, the second Celtic one, That's this is the yeah. suggestion yeah. that yeah. was not orange. Yeah. And he, um, <laughs> this is the orange I think it's actually more, yeah. it's, it's actually yeah. bringing out similarities yeah. rather than yeah. contrast. Yeah. Yeah. With a 10 year old. With a 10 year old, yes. Yeah. Yeah. See what you think. Yeah. So shall I say something about the cheese? Please, yes, yes. cheese. Okay. Okay. So you might, you might want to have a bit of biscuit before trying the cheese or the ports. Um, uh, we have two blue cheeses. I should say that Fiona thought, well, let's, let's turn the usual kind of port and cheese t uh, pairings on their head, first of all, so that you know, we'd, we'd have the sort of, um, perhaps the lighter, softer one with, uh, this time with the uh, vintage to bring up the, whereas often it's the other way around, it's often, often the other way around, isn't it? Um, and uh, people suggest having blue, the salty blues with the vintage and so on, but yeah, we'll, see, we'll see what happens here. So having said and decided that, we then thought, okay, let's go for some really unusual cheeses as well. So all the cheeses are raw milk cheeses, and there are various other features that link them. So the first cheese that, that you will receive is this slightly yellower one, uh, the yellower blue, is a cow's milk cheese. This is an extraordinary cheese that won, I was there, I was there. It's an extraordinary <laughs> cheese that, that won the World Cheese Awards trophy oh. this year. Yeah. It's the first time that an, a cheese from the States has won. It's um, made in Oregon, uh, and it, but it's actually a very old um, artisan dairy in Oregon. Um, and it was, it was first started in the Depression. Uh, and then it, it's obviously gone through various evolutions since it started turning up cheddar in the Depression. So it was actually created as a means of uh, um, the, the wives, particularly of, 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 the, of the lumberjacks, of the gold diggers, whoever, um, uh, earning some money. But essentially, it's always followed very traditional cheese making uh, methods, which is very rare or was very rare <laughs> in the States. It's, it, it, things are lifting up a bit. It is an extraordinary cheese. I, I wish I had the whole one to show you, but a whole little cheese costs 250 pounds alone. So it retails at $100 a kilo in the States and 100 pounds uh, a kilo here. Um, and uh, it is essentially, as you can see, it's a blue cheese, it's a cow's milk cheese, it's organic as well as raw. 
Um, and it's wrapped in organic sera vine leaf, leaves, and those leaves have been pre-soaked in a homemade pear brandy made by the producer. And it's actually taken about 12, 15 years to get this cheese to where it is. Um, and I know Mary Quick has been working with the producer the last five years. Oh, that's sorry. The that's sorry. The I was going to say, the first one I think is the Beanie Blue, isn't it? Which is an English one. Well, we the, decided to... Yeah, that yeah, is Beanie. And yes, this one, right. this one is... But do you think that's interesting? The pale one uh, is a sheep's blue. milk cheese. It's Beanie yeah. Blue. And what links these two cheeses is that actually they were both made in the Roquefort style, and both the producers, Robert Congdon in the case of the Beanley, went to Roquefort to try to work out the secrets of how it's done. <laughs> and Robert actually, Robin actually went and, and uh, scraped off some of the mould from the uh, notoriously secretive, um, notor uh, notoriously secretive um, Roquefort producers. Whoops, drop that. Um, and both, both producers actually also recreated the Rockfall Caves, one in Oregon, wow. uh, <laughs> one in Somerset, and so they have, uh, they recreated the caves, and they tried to recreate the mulls, of course it's not going to be the same as Rockfall, terroir comes into it, but they were both conceived of in a Rockfall style. Um, Do they both use the same... Um, Yes. Well, it could vary because of the artisan production, uh, so that it's not pasteurised, it's raw, it takes up the microflora. Uh, so did you and, say and one of them stole, like, the... He, he did, but he was, uh, Robin did, but he, he was completely shocked to discover that actually it ended up, yes, um, I mean, you can see the same environment as well. It's environment entirely, and it's, a, it's a, the, the, of course, it's the, the, the sheep. And in the case of the... Uh, Oregon producer, it, it's it's cow's milk, but he he, he actually spoke such brilliant dialect French that he, he absorbed all the secrets from the rock pop, which they wouldn't reveal to our English producers. Quite interesting backstory, but basically, yes, it's one of the world's most now most successful cheese. It's very rare, it's made in tiny quantities. Um, it is quite extraordinary, um, and at the time of the World Cheese Awards, uh, they decide it was just that the picture of perfectionists may not be exactly the same because, as you know, with, with artisan products, it was the same year of production. It was, it was World Cheese Awards took place um, mm -hmm. of October. So Is there any reason why you should reject it? Well, th this was actually Fiona's suggestion as to which to pair with which. Would be very interesting. Well, no, it, it was what you sent me actually. Well, you, you, you said. Well, originally you said let's pair the extraordinary one with what, and, and oh, then again. Sorry. But anyway, so you can decide. So what is the kind of simpler, closer to the rock style that's a little bit sweeter, richer uh, British pasture? Mm. Oh, they're the same penicillin. Wow. Uh, and the other one is very, very complex, uh, relatively speaking. Incredibly not wonderful choices. They're very interesting dark in terms of matching. That is just something else. The texture of that. The texture is there. It's wild, isn't it? I think it is completely wild. wild. I mean, you could claim that it's butyric, but it's um, it deliberately butyric. It does, it does, it? It? That's why I prefer it to the colita. I think the colita is a more cheese-friendly pork yeah. than the tawny yeah. because it's very fruity yeah. still, and it takes off a little bit of the, the sweetness, just a tiny wow. bit. I think it's a, it's a great. Uh, that's out. So. That's a shame. <laughs> it is an extraordinary experience, isn't it? Um, it, is. it, it really was a show-stopping moment at, at the final of the World Cheese Awards. Because it, it had, after all these years, kind of reached the pitch of perfection. And um, as I say, the first time an American cheese got there. But very emblematic of, of where American artisan cheese production is going now. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no great expert in in pairing cheese and pork, but I um, I will be after tonight. But um, yeah, it just needs to be powerful enough. Yeah. With um, 
cheese parings are the when you get softer, creamier cheeses, people often just head to pour any cheese matching. Whereas a, a nice noir white wine is, is perfect for things like that, it's much better. People don't think of it. Um, which is probably the you know, it's, it's a bit of education needed to do because people just think port with, with every cheese, but a really like light, soft, creamy cheese is going to be overwhelmed by the by port. So, um, yeah, just something punchy and you know, a nice bit of mold in it. Yeah. So, we've got the Chardonnay and 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 Chardonnay um, so Ruby as a category includes vintage port. So, um, so when we talk about the... Hello. Sorry. Sue, hello, nice to see you. Welcome. Nice to see you. I think it's your drink. Yes, a glass is on the menu. Most important. I've got glasses here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you just briefly in a couple of sentences say where you are? Yes. Log into what we can do. So if I sort some cheese. I think we're all up to date and everyone has a glass of the LVV in front of them. So when I when I talked previously about the, the, the two different branches of, of port production and we had the tawny styles which we have all tasted and enjoyed and the first thing you'll notice is the colour. So the tawny styles, that's why they're called tawny, they're, they're lighter in colour through that extended period in wood. Um, colour precipitates out all of these long uh, molecules and compounds that make up make up colour all, all clump together and precipitate out as sediment over time. Um, this is a ruby style, so I was saying vintage port is included within the ruby styles of port. And again, it's the colour, so you can see it's much darker, much more vivid. So this starts with exactly the same uh, base product as the tawny ports. However, once we've Pressed in the lagar, fortified, we're now drawn off and aged in huge um, old wood barrels. So these can be 10,000 litres or, 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 or more. So you have a huge volume of liquid compared with the surface area of oxygen on the wine. So you get no effect of oxygen on the wine as it ages. And it only ages in the case of a vintage port for 18 months to two years or in the case of a late bottled vintage port, which is what we have in front of us, we extend that aging to five years in, in barrel. And what that does, so by aging in, in larger vessels, you preserve the fruit. So the character you taste when you're tasting ruby style ports, you should get the flavors from the fruit, from the grapes. So lots of bramble fruit, um, plums, kind of cassis flavors, all these sorts of fruity flavors should abound from the glass. And the um, difference between LBV and vintage, um, so just saying that it, sometimes it's called the, the poor man's vintage port, an LBV, because it's generally slightly more modestly priced. I prefer to call it the impatient man's vintage port. Because a vintage port spends 
two years maximum in wood and then is bottled and the idea is you will age it in the bottle for a very long period of time. But vintage ports can age in bottle for up to 100 years or even more in the best vintages. And once it's sealed in the bottle, the evolution is a lot more um, gradual, a lot slower. Um, but not everyone can wait 30, 40 years from buying a bottle to wanting to drink it or has cellars extensive enough to, to start along that path, <laughs> which once you start is quite an expensive pastime. Um, but an LVV, the idea behind it is to have a vintage style of port with grapes of almost as high quality as the grapes <coughs> going into your vintage port, but to be able to drink it as soon as it's available on the, on the shelves. So by spending an extra three years in barrel, that softens the edges out, gives it a bit more <coughs> maturity, and then it's bottled, ready to drink. So late bottled vintage is a vintage port, all from one year, bottled later, after longer in barrel, and then it's ready to drink. So this is unfiltered, which means no clarification, no filtration, so you will get a sediment. And that also means it will mature in the bottle, if you desire, for five to ten years, very happily, and will develop as a, as a vintage port would. Beyond that, you're probably better buying a vintage port. Um, so that is the that's the LBV. The, the difference in terms of the grapes is purely, so all the grapes for this wine come from the same plots that the vintage port would come from. So vintage ports, which are the top wines from the estate, they're picked, vinified, and it's only on tasting after 18 months, two years in barrel, you're tasting the different barrels. And some barrels will be finer than others, and only at that point is a decision made, actually we're going to keep this barrel, age it for a further three years and bottle it as an LBV, as opposed to the finest barrels, that's our vintage port, we'll bottle that as a vintage port. So the, the, the sites, the fruit come from, everything is the same as our vintage port. So I personally feel that this style from Kinsley Val is the, probably the best value port we do. Um, whenever we take some areas out to the to the vineyard, there's always, you know, you serve port in a decanter and put it in front of them and everyone's, all these sommeliers from restaurants saying what vintage thing that is and they're naming all these great and classic vintages and you say, well actually it's our LBV that's 20 quid in, in a car <coughs> order. And, um, and it just shows the, the quality you get from an LBV port at a more modest price tag and it's ready to drink without having to sit in it for, for an extended period of time. So that's the LBV, um, we'll taste the full vintage next, so let's go on to the chocolate cheese. Oh yes, any questions about that? Yes. Do most of these ports have a similar proof? Yes, yes, so they Which are fortified to 19.5% alcohol, that's a very good question that I didn't mention. So all fortified to 19.5%, with the <coughs> tawny ports, the alcohol goes up as you age. So I think the Colletta will be probably around 20, maybe 20.5%. Mm. 20 um, the 10-year-old will still be 19 and a half. On the top of um, here. Reason being so that um, alcohol is a very long molecule and water is a very small one. So when you're aging in cask, the water flows through the wood more than the alcohol does. So we lose more water than we do alcohol in, uh, in, in aging fruit. So this, this tawny port, Agava, is that right? Uh, yeah, the, the, first, the first two are tawny styles, yeah. Uh, and they're both being t um, um, 19 and a half and for the 10 year old, and the, the Colletta will be about 20. Because this really packs a punch, I mean, it tastes really like it's 40 degrees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The tannins, though, because I was yes. wondering, you talked about the, um, with the oxidation and the colour, and yes. then it sinks down, is that partly the tannins that provide the colour? Exactly. So that's why they exactly. still smoother, and this has got it that dryness yes. and that sort of, exactly. that harshness that's that's a different sort of feeling to just the alcohol that... Yeah, exactly. Tannins. So when you age, tannins precipitate out. A lot of the sediment is tannins along with the colour and everything else. So yeah, that's, exa that's exactly correct. If you were to take a vintage port um, and age it in the bottle for 40 years, it would turn lighter in colour, the tannins would have precipitated out. You'd have more sediment and it would be smoother experience in drinking it and that would affect what you would pair it with um, when we taste some of the cheeses with this as you'll know tannin interacts with different elements of food um, to create a different experience in your palate so yeah that's that's exactly it the, the older a wine the, the less or the smoother the tannins will be and in the case of the tawny styles and aging in the barrels you get all of that precipitating out yeah, so yeah. they're much clearer as well yes yeah exactly as well as Yes, uh, the Tiberi Toscano, uh, the, um, the Covertio for this comes from Am Amadei, 
Toscano is one of their uh, favorite blends. It's Trinitario and, oh gosh, it's, it's and Criollo, of course. And it's uh, and it's they sort of decline it in various um, levels of cacao. And this the I think they use 66 percent for, for the uh, the chocolate volume chocolate, but I'm not sure. But it's 63, 64, 66, and 69, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So they it's a, one of their favorite uh, chocolates. And um, it's I think it's a very pretty chocolate. Mm. I I have to say that in the past I've tried I've I've found. Um, LBV or uh, quite difficult with chocolate, but I haven't um, really applied myself to it recently. Mm. So this is actually what I think. I'm finding it at the moment without chocolate, the LBV quite tanniny yeah. on the palate. I mean, mm. uh, much more so than mm. I remember. Yeah. Mm. But but not in an unpleasant way. But it's very tanniny. Yeah, well, especially when you move from tawny styles through to ruby, you really notice yeah. the tannin. Um, mm. Well, interesting. I mean, yes, because there is uh, acidity in the table, isn't there? Which, which mm. kind of, because there is some acidity quite, quite noticeably mm. in, in this, yeah. this LBV, and um, that works quite well. I'm just wondering whether the cheeses should be the other way around, thinking about the tannins. I don't know how many tannin, how much tannicity there is in the vintage port, but of course, one of the things that tames tannins is creaminess and mm. and um, and. Uh, you know, free protein, and um, it's likely to be more so in the soft cheese. But, however, we are going to try this with a cheddar-style cheese. Um, and uh, I mean, Fiona suggested a kind of really, you know, a traditional punchy cheddar. So I don't know if that will work. But maybe the acidity would actually uh, balance out quite nicely. So the cheese that you have here, which is quite recognisably cheddar-style, is made according to a very old cheddar recipe. It's called Havod. If any of you were at the debate the other week, um, you'll have heard Patrick Holden speak. Uh, Patrick was the founder of the uh, founder director of the Soil Association in Rauran's Sustainable Food Trust, and he has a very tiny herd of Ayrshire cows in Saladigion. I can't pronounce the name of the, fa- of the farm. I would begin to do that, but so everybody just calls it the Holden Family Farm. It does have a wonderful Welsh name. Uh, Ayrshire's are a, a very difficult breed, and also he has very sparse land. I suppose he's illustrating the joys of sustainable uh, pasture farming. So it's very sparse land that couldn't be used for growing crops. Uh, Ayrshire's are not traditionally bred because they, their yield is low, but their protein, the protein in milk, is very high. Um, and it makes for a rather interesting cheese. So the cheese has actually evolved over the years, and um, they researched it a lot. So we've always made a cheddar, but this is now a cloth-bound cheddar made to a very, very old recipe, and using the local microbiota, if you like, the, 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 the lo- all the local uh, um, flora, fauna, whatever, to give it its very unique flavor. So the, if you eat it close to the rind, there's quite a kind of... Um, biting potato skin stroke horseradish sort of note to it. Um, it more, more to the centre, it's a little bit sweeter, but it does have acidity, as, as do all these cheddars, and I, I don't know if that's going to match well or not. It's uh, an interesting concept. Mm. It's got a very rich the, the next wine we're going to taste is the 2007 vintage. So I've actually, this is the first time I've tasted this for years, actually, today. Um, so Vintage Port is Ruby style, so um, present same way, it's a large old oak barrels, and here we've only spent 18 months to two years in these large oak barrels, all old oak, so no flavour of the wood. And, um, and then bottled, so 2007 was bottled in 2009, so we've had 10 years ageing in the bottle. And you'll see when it's poured round. Um, 2007, so it would have been bottled in 2009. So we've had uh, 10 years in the bottle. In the bottle. Um, and you'll see when it's poured, it's still dense, dark, incredibly purple and vibrant. So this is still, even though it's had 10 years in the bottle, this is still a young vintage pool. The, the drinking window for this is probably just starting, and will go on for another 50 years. So it, it really shows how long you can age vintage ports, and how, um, how the LBV is an, uh, an attempt to bring that drinking window closer to, um, to when you buy it. But it's very useful. 
Yeah. The literary reaction is wonderful. Yeah, very useful. It's amazing. Such character immediately in the nose. I mean, it doesn't. You know, I smell smell that fly. You would immediately even say port, or you can kind of get there. Yeah. Very very personal. It's amazingly complex. Sort of hot climate, red wine, and then yes, yeah. then you realise it's port. Violets and. Yeah. and, 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 and well, it's much better control, tanginess or acidity than the Yes, yeah, it would have softened a little bit. It's softened, it's a bit softened. So the, um, when we talk about vintage ports, the vintage is um, it's just the year, so the year of, of harvest. So these grapes were harvested in 2007, and then when we talk about the conditions of the vintage, it's about the weather conditions during the, the 2007 growing season. So um, a vintage port is only made in exceptional years, so a year when you get exceptional fruit. Um, in the case of 2007, it was what we would consider to be um, not actually the textbook ideal vintage. Usually you're looking for really hot, so you get lots of ripeness, the fruit gets very ripe, um, lots of potential alcohol. 2007 was a cool, cool year, very cool summer, but it was an incredibly long growing season. So you can measure the growing season in what's called degree days, and that is every day that the temperature is above 15 degrees, the vines do work. So they ripen the fruit. Below 15 degrees, they don't do anything. They just relax, no sugar goes to the fruits, they're inactive. So you can have a very short but intense period of heat, but if the total number of days above 15 degrees aren't enough, then you won't get ripe fruit. So 2007 was cooler, but a very long growing season. So lots of days which were temperate and warm. So you get excellent ripeness, but without extremes of temperature giving you baked fruit characters. So any flavors of raisins, figs, kind of dried fruit character, which you get in incredibly hot years because the fruit gets very ripe, sometimes overripe, and you get some slightly baked characteristics. So this is what I would call a very pretty vintage. You've got lots of floral character, violets. It's still incredibly dense and structured, as any vintage port will be, but it's slightly more restrained in its um, in its outlook. Um, but will still be. I mean, the acidity is fantastic, and um, the density of, of fruits great. So you, this will age for an incredibly long period of time if you if you want it to. But as a style, this is. Um, yeah, slightly prettier, slightly more floral in, in terms of character, which is actually um, quite contrasting with the LBV, which is mu you have much more of that kind of slightly baked fruit character in the LBV, which will be an expression of, of the year um, in terms of the heat. So the, the classic hot year is 2003. If anyone remembers, it was when the, it went, we went over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the UK and Europe was in a heat wave all summer. So if you taste any port from 2003, it's... It, if you do the sort of thing of tasting different vintage ports and guessing what year it is, 2003 is raisins, and you get that really baked raisin character. And 2007, it's that violence, the petals, the slightly herbal notes to it that, um, that distinguish 2007. So yeah, so that's the vintage, and um, yeah. this is the final of the ports. A any questions well, no, we, about ports? Yeah. You know, you know with vintage. So I, I just got back from Portland. I went to Graham's, and, and we, we saw in the cellar there was like the vintage of 1927. So, so many bottles from 1927, 1955, and they cost thousands and thousands of pounds. You know, do, do people actually end up drinking those bottles, or you know, you <laughs> age things for so yeah. long and they cost so much money? Yeah. Is it just an investment? Like, what actually happens? To so, these? really good question. Um, port is actually a bit of a. Um, it's, a it's actually a really good. Um, not investment, it's a good buy if you buy old stuff because a lot of port is bought to age and because its life is so long you get lots of cellars that are bequeathed full of old port. So a lot of it doesn't get drunk because people wait and wait and wait and they think well let's wait till it gets to 60 years old, oh let's wait till it gets to 70 years old and as soon as the century is within within sight, people hold on, oh, let's see if I can drink a 100-year-old port. So there's lots of port on the secondary market, which is incredibly old and quite reasonable. Um, I imagine in Graham's, because it's been housed in their cellars, um, you have a perfect provenance. It's been aged in their cellars, so the price will be high. But on the, on the second-hand market, you can get very old vintage port for quite reasonable prices. Um, it's not that much of an, an investment. Um, you can buy it as an investment, but certainly not in the realm of Bordeaux, which will go up, you know, it can go up 10, 20% year on year. Um, 
so yeah, I would say with port, if you are thinking of buying port and laying down, for vintage port, 20 years is a really nice sweet spot, and then just drink it. Drink it with friends and enjoy it. And if you end up leaving a bottle in a cupboard that you then find when you're when you're 70 or 80 and you're like, oh my goodness, here's a 60 or you know, whatever old port, then, then bonus. But, um, but yeah, for me, I find that 20 years from, from vintage is showing signs of age, but still with the, the vibrance of youth. And, um, and you can pick bottles up of 20, 30 years of age for, for not too much. I just got a bottle from my um, a wine merchant I work with in 1987, which is my vintage, and, uh, and it was 25 pounds. So, mm -hmm. it was a bit bad. that was staff project. I just got a 2006. Yeah, so. okay, yeah. Uh -huh. And that was like 40 euros. Yeah, so I mean, you can get it quite modestly. Yeah. One has to be very careful about storage. Yes. There was an American millionaire who bought a bottle from the seller of Thomas Jefferson for a very large amount of money. We know the man. And he put it on display in a case under a spotlight. <laughs> and the cork wow. dropped into the bottle when it dried out. Yeah, oh uh, it's, uh, yeah for, sto for storing um, port, actually, because it's so um, such a dense wine, it's not as fragile as the wine, so if you're aging for what I would call medium term, so up to 20, 30 years, mm. it's, it's quite resilient. But the big thing is the cork, so alcohol will start to degrade the cork, so, um, so you just have to be really careful when opening the cork. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's actually, it's actually pretty resilient. Um, <laughs> it's not like if you had a, a bottle of red wine, variances in temperature and all the rest of it over the course of 10, 15 years can attack the wine and make it undrinkable. So there's a question. Yeah, so actually that was an ideal um, response to John because I have a follow-up question which is, um, I mean I know with wine after a certain number of years, you know, even you know, wine that's sort of laid down for later consumption, that there's a point at which it um, becomes, uh, you know, not vinegary but mm. starts to go yes. off. You know. so, does does that ever happen with port or I mean is it something that always happens and people don't know about it? Yeah, so all wine's a, a living living product. Once it's in the bottle it's evolving. So all wine <laughs> will undergo a a curve. And the most important thing to say is it's all personal preference. So my drinking curve might be completely different to your drinking curve. If I prefer younger flavours, mine's gonna go up quicker and then drop off quicker because as soon as the flavours turn from bright, fresh, red fruit to slightly baked fruit, some woody, leathery characters, if I don't like those flavours, a wine which is 20 years old that I say that <coughs> me, could be perfect for you if you like yes. those developed characteristics. But every wine will undergo that evolution. Um, when we say a wine is past it, it's when all of the fruit has disappeared and it doesn't have the acidity or any other structure, structural components mm. of the wine to support what's left. So you end up tasting and it just yeah. is like, you know, old, old so leather. I like the word flabby. Flabby for <laughs> wine, especially. I, I, was wine brought up, I was brought up by a grandfather who made not very good wine and he's the dreaded word in the family was madérisé. Madérisé was the, yeah, the, the, the general yeah. curse, you know, in Vouvray, when you're Vouvray. So, ah, horrible wine, madérisé, yeah. uh, oxidised. And yeah. I'm still very wary of it because I've had too mm. much of it as a, not as a child, but as a young person. <laughs> yeah. Probably as a child. No, this is mostly white. Yeah, yeah. So no, 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 this is mostly white. No, 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 it was white. Can it was raw white. What, what that meant? <coughs> it was a little bit off. Uh, if it, uh, slightly, slightly sort of mushroomy at the edges, and mm. a bit sweet and lacking definition. Mm. Mm. Loses uh, fruit and brightness yeah. and acidity yes, because yes, like the oxygen single. gets yeah. to it and yeah. it goes all discolored. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. So the so the and the benefit of port is that the the period over which those changes happen is much longer because it's preserved by the alcohol. There's a much greater um, density of flavour. I sometimes talk about aging wine, a good way of describing it, depending on how close anyone's been to doing these things in school, is um, when you put a drop of black ink on blotting paper mm. and it yes. slowly spreads out to expose all of the different component colours in that dot of black ink, that to me is what happens with wine when you age it. So a young vintage port, which is incredibly dense, and when you were, if you were to taste the 2017 vintage, 
it's it's so intense, it's so dense, it's sometimes quite hard to see all the different components. But as you age, <coughs> everything starts to spread apart and you get to see the violets and the fruit and then these secondary characteristics of wood and everything becomes more defined. But over too long, it will fade out too much and you don't you don't have enough of those flavours to carry it. So that's how, how I like to explain ageing wine. It's, it's the separation of what initially is very dense and concentrated into being able to define the different flavour components of that, of that wine. And do um, what both wine and port kind of, uh, when their flavours fall off, I don't know what the term is. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, are, are they sort of fairly consistent? I mean, do they vary or could you, could you say this is, you know, after a certain number of years, this is when you shouldn't um, even think about drinking vintage wine and after a certain number of years you shouldn't drink about, uh, think about drinking vintage port? There's, uh, there can be bottle variation, but the, the biggest variable is how it's stored. Um, oh, really? So we have in, in our terms of temperature. Yeah, te variation of temperature. So it's fluctuations in temperature. Oh, so for our sins in our office, we have a, a samples cupboard um, that is on an external wall, and in summer it takes the full brunt of the sun. So in summer it gets to 40 degrees, and in winter it's hovering around freezing. So two two summers, two winters in our samples cupboard is worth 10 years of ageing in a cellar. <laughs> <laughs> kind of everything, the amount of bottles I've found in that cupboard, oh, well, let's see what, how that's tasting, it should be nice and it's gone. It's it's gone. It's, um, so that's it. It's, <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah well, everything, everything, we've now got a fridge in there because we found, uh, yeah, it, it was too sad to see these lovely bottles. So it's consistent storing at a consistent temperature. Yeah, and it's, the, yeah, the actual temperature people can get very hung up on, but consistency is the key. Yeah. So the, the actual temperature people can get quite hung up on, but it, it, the most important thing is the consistency of temperature. Um, obviously you don't want it too hot or too cold, but as long as you're in a, you know, the same sort of temperature. What's the ideal? Sort of? 12 to 13 degrees. So, you know, the same sort of temperature you'd store your onions to stop them sprouting or going off, but as long as it's consistent, yes, it's consistent. you, you yes. get. You know, um, but, it, but it was interesting, I don't know if it happens with port, but with wine, the sort of lesser vintages were terribly fragile once opened 20 years later. So I remember when I moved house, I gave a case of different wines, but my better ones to a Sarah Jane Staines and Richard, who can't be here tonight, and they, I used to get phone calls from them saying, you know, we're about to open a bottle of um, Du Coup Bucayou, something, it's a nice one, but not the right vintage. And then I, I used to hear ecstatic comments from Sarah, and then Richard said, no, 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 it's just gone off. Because <laughs> it went off about after 15 minutes after yeah. it had been opened, it just died into the ether it went. So I was very glad I hadn't kept them through a move and sort of six months in storage. At least they enjoyed them for five minutes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the chocolate with yes, this yes, is let's do that. the least pretty chocolate in the whole <laughs> evening. <laughs> However, it's going to be delicious, I'm sure. And it is, it is actually a prune. It's a cheese. I to wait, wait okay. <laughs> so, so guys, your, your final cheese. Um, Again, it's a raw milk cheese. It's, it's organic and all but name. I should say that both the Rogue Valley and Patrick's cheese are organic. This is virtual organic. So this is made by somebody called um, Julie Cheney, who's, who made Tunworth, first of all, in Hampshire. Uh, but she had other ambitions. She started making a light, soft cheese called St. Jude. Um, she started making that because St. Jude is the patron saint of lost causes and she'd just broken up there and apparently everybody said, oh, you're, you're hopeless, you've just given up on it, you know, anyway. But she then, she then upped, upped the stakes and actually upped sticks as well and she, she went in pursuit of the best milk she could find in the UK and arguably that comes from Montbelliard. Uh, cattle that, that, that are raised in Bungay in Suffolk by Fen Farm Dairy. You may have heard of them. They do this wonderful, wonderful uh, raw cultured butter that you can buy now in, in, in some of the best cheese shops. It's, it's, uh, it's really the first butter that I've enjoyed as much as French butter because I love cultured butter. So Montbelia, like Ayrshire's, uh, are, 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 are apparently they're really temperamental cows, a bit like Salaire. Um, and uh, but they have wonderful, um, again, high, not just high fat but high protein content to the milk, and um, they give. Uh, it's a really very unique flavour. She also makes this cheese very, very slowly. It's a fresh cheese made immediately. The milking stops, so it's got to be made immediately. But the coagulation, if you know anything about these things, is very, very slow 
which, which affects the size of the protein molecules, not only the texture, which is described as being sort of moussey, but really leads to lots of complexities in the cheese. So you can actually, as it were, taste what the cows have been eating. And I hope you like it. It's, it's one of my great favorite cheeses. Um, and it's, it's, it's often used now as a textbook case in the Guild of, of, of Fine Food, the, the, the Academy of Cheese Tastings because it is such an extraordinary cheese and it's now winning lots of awards. It didn't before it moved to Montbillier milk, which is really interesting. So again, it, it shows you what can be done with, with really painstaking methods and, and old traditions and um, it's a good argument against veganism. So I was, I was just saying about the, um, the, the, the vintage port is almost quite whiny or vinous, as we'd say in style. And, um, so Christian is... Christian, who is the managing director of Kinsey Lavelle, doesn't like overly sweet styles of port, so the, the um, sugar level is, is on the lower side. And also one of the unique characteristics of Kinsey Lavelle's vineyards is that lovely kind of floral character, the violets, and the, sometimes you get bits of rosemary kind of coming through. So to accentuate that, we, we don't want too much sugar in the wine, and we really want to, to allow those elements of the wine to sing. So. Um, you really get it in the vintage stars, the vintage ports. So the vintage ports in the Val all should show that character which is unique to the vineyard of Kinsey and the Val. Um, and I think you really get it in the 2007, that, that lovely, pretty, heffily um, nose and character of the wine. I mean, you could, I mean, I've, I've, I've had two glasses of this now, but you know, you kind of sometimes port a glass is all you need, but I find with the Val it's Especially the vintages, they're, they're eminently drinkable. They, they slip down like the like wine. So, um, because they change as you open them, right? Yes, yeah. So, um, you've got to drink them within 24 hours. Of yes, you. yeah. So, a, a, a vintage you have port. To share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah. Like, so, that's why you have the, the whole etiquette of passing the decanter and not letting it touch the table. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. once you've decanted a vintage port, you should, you should finish it that night, really. So, um, yeah. Once you pull the cork, all of the aging and changing of the wine is done, so it's time to drink up once you pull the cork. How could you never be very interested, and I don't know if everybody else will be, but um, if it's really hard to remember the, the taste and flavour of each port, but I'd be interested to know, um, and, and the same for thick teas and chocolates at this time. Um, how many hands up for the favourite ports? <coughs> mm, yeah, the favorite why not? Cheese or the favourite chocolate? Mm, <laughs> yeah, why not? Yes, it's always quite fun. I've made some notes, I know, but <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. No, that's nice, nice soup. That's a nice idea. Who's, who's, who's going to call? Uh, who's going to speak? That's a good one. Nice to know. <laughs> well, who uh, actually? If we all write down our favourites, we can uh, just have a favourite cheese. Favourite cheese? Yes. So it's well, so so favourite port, perhaps. Mm. Or uh, yeah. favourite, no, let's simplify ourselves. Let's start, let's start with favourite ruby port, mm. and then favourite uh, uh, tony, because that's a, bit, that's a bit of a better way to, and then we can, <coughs> we can uh, rarefy it. <laughs> My husband said, how many of us are sober enough to make a judgment? <laughs> the answer to that, Mary, is all of us. None of us. Either way, either all or none. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I don't know if I would pay three times as much for the 2007 vintage movie. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so if we say hands up for Tawny Port, the favourite one, um, and then we can just say yep. which one okay. goes. But that's, yes, okay, let's do it like that because it would be... So the, the ten-year-old? Yeah. Ten year old and eat. So the the Quinto de Naval for me. They're, 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 they're ten year old or the Colletta? Um, the, the so hands oh, no, sorry, the Colletta. Colletta, so hands up for the Colletta. Yeah. Well, that's, that's overwhelming. Well, I think that's interesting. <laughs> and then on the Ruby side, hands up for the LBV. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of, um, and then for the, and then the, the, the so the vintage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we had about we had about four with with price coming into it for the 2012. 
And I think just regarding price, and just the, on and the re so it would, it, yeah, and then for, so for the 2007 taking price out of it, mm. I think was was quite unanimous. Yeah. Mm. Do you know what that would retail for? The, yeah, the 2007? Back. Yeah, between yeah, 80 and 90 pounds. How is it? Oh, I think it's on the map. It's on the map. Oh, I didn't see that. There we are. Oh, so you were, you were, you were completely un un unbiased with any, any pricing, yeah. Um, and then, and then between, the, so between the Collietta and the, and the vintage, so let's say hands for Collietta. Yeah. Yeah, Ooh, so the tawny, tawny wins over vintage, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm strongly for vintage. And the vintage, so we have Love the vintage. Yeah. And what does the, um, oh, it's yeah, the Constitution yeah. Revival, that sells for, yes, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts for what it's worth, the, um, I love Collietta as a, I love tawny styles, so the company I, I work for as well, we, we deal a lot with Sherry. And the tawny stars have those elements, that lovely nuttiness, the caramel, the effect of thyme in wood. So I love tawny styles, but in port I, I prefer the young, mm. younger tawny styles. And that 2005, I think, is a perfect age. So what's that, 14 years in wood. Um, so that I really like that. If you have older Colliettas, I would probably then start swinging over to the vintage ports. But then tasting those vintage ports, so I have in my modest rack at home. I have two bottles of the 2007 and I was wondering when to open them, but I think that's, it's just beginning to sink. Christmas. And yes, yeah, so Christmas. And then a few, 2003, which is a really raisiny vintage, which is, it's, it's just so, I mean, I just, whenever you get a chance, I'll open that. But um, that 2007, I think, surprised me, considering it's relatively young, so only 10 years in bottle. And when you talk about ports having a drinking window for anything from now to 60 years time, I think mean, it's really coming into its own now. So from, from now for another ten years, that could be full of all those pretty floral characteristics. So um, yeah, really nice. And the, and the cheeses. Wow.